Today, diplomats from around the world gathered in Durban, South Africa, to start two weeks of negotiations on climate change. Two previous summits in Copenhagen and Cancun failed to reach an agreement on climate change action. Scientists are warning of dire consequences if an accord is not reached. The World Meteorological Association reported that greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere have hit an all-time high and are rising at ever faster rates. Oxfam International has just released a report detailing how heat waves and droughts are driving crop yields down and food prices up. The World Bank estimates those. Those rising prices drove about 44 million people into extreme poverty last year. And yet, as dire as all that sounds, negotiations over how to stop climate change remain stalled. FSRN's Brian Edwards Teekert is covering the talks in Durban and brings us this report. The gridlock in these talks seems to start with a country that has cumulatively produced more greenhouse gases than any other. Here is U.S. Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change, Jonathan Pershing. If there is an agreement, and the agreement legally binds the United States and does not legally bind other countries with the same level of force, it is clear we could not ratify such an agreement. In fact, the United States is the only country in the world not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which requires industrialized nations to cut their emissions, but does not require the same of poor countries. For rich nations, burning fossil fuels was their ticket to development. And less developed countries don't want to give up their shot at prosperity to fix a problem they're mostly not responsible for. But large developing nations like China have become major polluters and will need to be part of any solution to climate change. So U.S. negotiators have introduced a non-binding arrangement, have every country pledge to do something about its greenhouse gas emissions. It's been quite clear that if we required a legal obligation to act we would not have gotten even the current set of actions. So in some sense, that structure would have precluded the major emerging economies from joining this process. And yet those economies represent the vast majority of future growth. And unless we can bring them in, we can't solve the problem. Even though everyone here agrees the Kyoto Protocol is not enough to curb the worst impacts of climate change, most agree it's better than nothing. Without action at this meeting, Kyoto's binding pollution cuts will expire in 2012, and plenty of observers don't think the U.S. approach will be any better. Here is Alden Meyer with the Union of Concerned Scientists. If that's what we end up with at the end of next week, you're basically guaranteed to see uh, gridlock in this process, to see the Kyoto Protocol wither away. And you would see basically going to a voluntary Wild West kind of regime where everyone decides by themselves what they're going to do. You add it up and see where it gets you. And and what we know from history is that that doesn't work very well. China, currently the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, says it wants to see an extension of the Kyoto Protocol, which would mean leaving China with no binding obligation to cut its own emissions. Meanwhile, Canada, which has skyrocketing carbon emissions from its tar sands industry, has announced it intends to pull out of the Kyoto Protocol. The European Union, Kyoto's greatest defender among industrialized nations, says it won't support extending the Kyoto Protocol without a roadmap towards bringing in more large polluters, something China and India are not likely to agree to. So the talks start with what appear to be irreconcilable differences. The only areas where they're expected to advance are relatively minor, how to structure a fund that will help poor countries cut their greenhouse gas emissions and cope with the effects of climate change, how to run a program to combat deforestation. Grassroots groups organizing outside the talks say that isn't close to enough. Many of us here, Many of us here can't, get in. can't get in. We don't think that's fair. The first General Assembly of Occupy Durban, on a small grass island next to the talks, surrounded on all sides by three lanes of traffic. Monday morning, they were joined by someone who spent the last round of climate talks sitting in a negotiator's chair, Pablo Salon, former United Nations ambassador from Bolivia. We need emissions reductions from 40 to 50 percent. That is what science, uh, what developing countries are asking for. So that should be the outcome. I mean, it should be an outcome that establishes that those emission reductions are going to take place in the north and not that they are going to be in some way Uh, bought from uh, carbon credits in the South. Salone made exactly those points during last year's talks in Cancun. He tried to block the assembly from moving forward with the voluntary framework the United States put together. And even though the assembly of 192 nations is supposed to operate by consensus, his objections were gaveled down by the conference chair. No matter what arguments you put on the table, no matter what science you put on the table, 
if there is no social pressure, things are not going to change. So the real result of the negotiations is outside. It's not inside. What that outside pressure will add up to remains to be seen. Climate justice organizers are planning actions throughout the week and a mass demonstration in Durban on Saturday. Some are calling for the poor nations in these talks to either walk out or hold a sit-in. Inside the talks, there's no sign that's in the offing. Brian Edwards Teekert, Free Speech Radio News, Durban. Stay tuned to FSRN for ongoing coverage of the climate change talks in Durban, South Africa.